finished describing this study area. Now, before I come to the examples and the illustrations of this hypothesis testing approach, I need, quickly need to explain to you uh, a slightly different way of coupling the different methods. And this is based on, a, on the so-called concept of variation of information. Um, and what variation of information does, it measures the amount of information contained in one variable about another variable. And practically speaking, it says, we assume there is a relationship there, but instead of saying, like I showed in the previous example, it's a linear relationship or a logarithmic relationship or whatever, um, we want to find this relationship as part of the inversion. And um, I'm going to skip the, the equations part for now, both in the interest of time and in the interest that sort of it can be sort of quite difficult to grasp, but we'll show you a, a, a practical example how we calculate variation of information and what it means. So here we have two models. This is a vertical slice through some models. You can see depth here on the uh, side, so it's 100 kilometer, 200 kilometer, 300 kilometer. Uh, and then longitude, so this is actually a slice through, through one of the models through this uh, part in the Western US. Uh, and on the top, there's a density model, and at the uh, bottom, there is a resistivity model. You can see the color scales here. And if you compare those models visually, you would say, okay, there is not a lot of similarity between those two models. We can't really see a lot of features that look the same, and this doesn't change on color scale or anything. Um, they're just, those two methods just individually see the, the world quite different. And to calculate this vari variation of information, um, what we would do is we plot the density anomaly and the resistivity in each of those cells that you can see here against each other in, in, the, in, the, in the horizontal plane. So in the parameter space, um, uh, resistivity density and that's what you see here on the left hand side and what you can see is you get this blob of, of points this cloud of points and there's no discernible relationship and to calculate this variation of information constraint we turn that into a histogram which just sort of focuses those features and uh, allows us to um, turn this parameter plot on the left hand side um, into probability densities. And if you are um, interested in the details, there is sort of quite a bit of literature on this um, out there. And what we can see now is that, for example, knowing that the density in a certain part of the model, the density anomaly is zero, doesn't tell us anything about the resistivity. So the resistivity associated with that density value can be anything. This is a log scale between 10 and uh, several thousand meters. And vice versa, if we know something about the resistivity, we know very little about the density. So there's no real relationship. And this is then uh, results in yeah, a low mutual information or a high variation of information. But if we have something that starts to look like this, so we have some sort of noisy relationship, you can actually see um, it looks a bit like a linear relationship, but with some, some complexity. And on the right-hand side, we can see that, that histogram, which yeah, just focuses on the, the most important features. Then we start to get um, a higher mutual information or a lower variation inform of information. And this is what we do in the inversion. So in the inversion, we try to um, produce situations where the histogram is, uh, is focused and we can get a um, good one-to-one -one relationship between those, um, those quantities. And I'm going to use this now in the next few examples for some constraint and joint inversions, and then sort of discuss this in, the, in this context of this hypothesis testing that I was talking about. Um, but before that, I just want to talk to you a little bit about sort of my joint and constraint inversion recipe on a sort of very high level. Of course, the details then depend a bit on the algorithm. Um, so what I typically do and what I have done in the next examples that I'm going to show you is uh, the first step is always run individual inversions of each data sets. And that's mostly to determine what I would call the technical parameters of the inversion. So you need to choose 
those of you who have done a 3D inversion or a 2D inversion of some data, you need to choose things like the discretization, so the, what, what are your cells, how do you describe your model, the regularization, and a, and a few other things. There are quite a few um, parameters that need to be established. Um, and also, you need to find out how well do I actually fit the data? I mean, statistically speaking, if you know your data uncertainties, there are sort of hard and fast criteria that you can use to say, okay, I fit my data statistically within the uncertainty. But again, those of you who have done this know that we, the uncertainties are quite uncertain. So um, very often we cannot fit our data to the level that we expect to. Um, so the individual inversion is, is sort of this exploration for, okay, what kind of misfit is appropriate for, for this data set? And I, I find this a sort of a crucial step that needs to be done before you can do any joint inversion. And then what I do is, I run the joint or constraint inversion um, and set this, this coupling factor, this coupling weight as, as high as I possibly can. So if you think back to the, the equation that I showed you, this, this kappa value. So I want to, to find the strongest uh, possible connection between those two different models and see how far I can take the in, in, inversion. And that's also to avoid the fact that if, if the, the, the coupling is too low, what you're basically doing is you're running two individual inversions. But very often what you will see is you, you run the inversion and then you, you, you make some progress, you, you fit a bit of the data, but it doesn't fit particularly well, especially compared to the individual inversions. And then I go into a, a sort of stepwise sequence where I reduce the coupling and um, repeat this until I can fit the data. So the idea is to get the, the highest possible coupling between the data sets and at the same time fit the data um, with uh, to the same degree that the individual inversions uh, fit the data. And then you are in a situation where you have a strongly connected model with um, a good data fit. <clears throat> and the first example I show you is um, a constrained magnetic inversion. So I take the, the seismic velocity model as fixed. So this is this um, uh, surface wave-based model and take the total field uh, magnetic anomaly uh, and make a constrained inversion with the, those two ingredients uh, with this mutual information or variation of information constraints. So I say fit the magnetic data that it looks very similar to the velocity model, which I'm showing down here. So here you can see this uh, slices at 20 and 30 kilometers. So yellow here is low velocities and uh, blue here is, is high velocities. Um, so, so make the structures um, match or establish sort of a, as much of a re relationship as you possibly can. And at the same time, fit the magnetic observations. Uh, and he, he, on the top here, you can see the susceptibility results. So you can see here the, the structures in terms of magnetic susceptibility at 20 and at 30 kilometers. Um, and yeah, this is what I would typically call or what people would probably typically call an unsuccessful joint inversion because you, you compare our reference velocity model and our susceptibility model at 20 kilometers and there isn't much similarity here, yes? We can see some structures, actually the strongest structures that have evolved here have this north, um, east, southwest trend, uh, and we can see nothing similar um, in the velocity model. If we go down to about 30 kilometers, we can start to see some more similarity. For example, here is some high velocity structure that um, corresponds in shape uh, to um, high susceptibility. But still, there are quite a few structures here that are in the susceptibility model uh, and uh, that are not in the velocity model. And if we look at the parameter relationship for this model, it becomes, if you want, so even worse initially, sort of if you, if you, that's what you're after, establishing a connection here. Um, because I, 
as part of the inversion, I also want to establish a one-to-one -one relationship. And you can see that here for significant parts of the model, the inversion has not been able to do that. Yes, you can see here, um, there's a large scatter. So knowing, for example, that your seismic velocity is 3.5 kilometers per second doesn't tell you anything about susceptibility. There's a large variety of susceptibilities that correspond to that. And um, for uh, the other way around, so knowing susceptibility also doesn't tell you anything about velocity. And here you can see the color that's sort of certain depth ranges. So you can see those reddish colors that's all in the crust. And so you can see the scatter in the crust is, is extreme. So we cannot really establish um, a relationship in the crust. But then something quite surprising happens. Um, and we can see that for deeper layers and higher velocities, all of a sudden we get this nice one-to-one -one relationship, nearly like a, like a linear relationship between the two. But then those of you who know something about magnetics will say, hmm, that's a bit weird because um, that 60 to 100, 150 kilometers, we're dealing with magnetic data. Um, we're way above the Curie temperature, so, so we don't expect any strong magnetic anomalies at these depths. And that's definitely true. And also what you can see when you do some tests, which I'm not going to show here, is that actually the, the magnetic data has virtually no sensitivity to this part um, of the model. So. This is purely what the inversion is trying to do. It's a demonstration that if you want, so if it can, the inversion will try to, to make a one-to-one -one relationship, but this is not um, driven by the data. The data doesn't, doesn't know anything about it, but where we have sensitivity, um, there is no direct relationship between uh, the, the structures that are sensed by the magnetic data and um, the structures that is are in the velocity model. Now you might say, okay, so, so so what's that? I mean, you know, you have one part where you have no sensitivity, and there you have a relationship, so that's sort of a bit useless. Uh, and then you have another part where you wanted to establish a relationship in the crust, and you have sensitivity, but there you don't get a relationship. But this is exactly what I wanted to sort of establish here as this hypothesis testing. Um, sort of approach, if you turn it around, you, you could say, okay, what we've learned about the Earth in this region is the structures sensed by the magnetics are different, and they have to be different, the, the data sort of mandates that they are different from the structures that we have in the seismic velocity model. So, for example, a, a, a comparison between those, 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 those models or sort of independent models doesn't make any sense. Now, I haven't gone into a deep analysis of these structures, but of course, you can then go into these structures and see how they relate to tectonic features, um, both from the magnetics and the velocities. Uh, and you can be certain that there are differences there and you can use that to drive your analysis. So if you want so you have disproved or refute the hypothesis that there's a direct connection between magnet magnetic susceptibility and seismic velocity in, in this region. And I think that's a, a quite powerful statement that you can make and maybe even a more powerful statement than if you can establish a relationship because as I said you always uh, are a bit in doubt whether that relationship is actually true whereas here you you, you can say I definitely know the the structures in the magnetics and the structures in the velocity um, are have to be quite different so that's um, a test with or an example with magnetic data. Now we can do the same with gravity and um, the seismic velocity model. And many, or again, those of you that have um, done seismic um, inversions, you, you will know that there are very often people assume 
some sort of relationship between density and, and velocity. Um, so that seems maybe a, a bit more like a, a, a reasonable. Um, so, oh, sorry, I had I forgot I had this, but I already talked about. So yeah, so here uh, are the results of the constrained uh, gravity inversion. So I've, I'm doing the same thing again. I'm doing a, a, an inversion of the gravity data. And I keep the velocity model fixed as a constraint. Now there's one change in the previous slide. You can see if you look at the color scale, this is absolute velocity that I'm using here. And here I'm using velocity anomaly. The, the results for the previous example for the magnetics don't really change when you use either velocity anomaly or um, absolute velocity. Here I haven't changed this to velocity anomaly because I'm also dealing with density anomaly. So the two things seem to be uh, quite um, or better related to each other. And on top here, you can see the result at uh, 30 kilometers. So this is a horizontal slice at 30 kilometers through the, the Snake River Plain and, and Yellowstone is somewhere over here. And you can see the, the density anomaly model and the velocity anomaly model. And here we can see quite good correspondence, even uh, visually between those, those two models. You can see, for example, this high or positive velocity anomaly also corresponds largely to a positive uh, density anomaly. <clears throat> and we can also see other sort of secondary structures, for example, this, this structure here that is sort of expressed similarly in the, in the density model. And now if we look at the parameter relationship, we get a very different um, picture than we had with magnetics. Yes, on the magnetics, we had this sort of large scatter in the, in the shallow part and then this yeah, quite artificial um, structure this relationship in, in the deep part. Whereas here we get a very strong uh, linear relationship between density anomaly and, and velocity anomaly. And that's compatible with um, what people think about how this should, should look like um, within the earth. But then we also get um, some structures that sort of are off this um, main relationship. So we can see here the, what the joint inversion would like to do under, under this sort of variation of information constraint is would to have just one line here. But there are certain parts um, that are um, that deviate from this line. Now, some of them, this light sort of peachy color that's sort of probably very near surface uh, scatter, so where the velocity model is not particularly great and there's heterogeneity in the, um, in the density. So that's uh, probably just um, yeah, a fact that the velocity model is not particularly good. But we can see there are deeper parts here, in the, again, in the mantle, and there are structures that do not conform to this, this simple relationship. And again, in the spirit of this hypothesis testing, I would say these areas where things do not conform to our expectations, where we uh, where the joint inversion tells us, okay, you cannot have a simple one-to-one -one relationship between your parameters. The data compels us to, to deviate from it. Those are the most interesting parts. So I'm, I'm not going to go into this because I haven't had the time to really um, yeah, think about sort of what it means tectonically. But for example, my first approach or my next step now would be to, to really focus on these structures here that seem to be both mandated by the data, but also uh, deviate from, from this assumption because it means uh, that they are, um, yeah, they are features that are in this joint inversion because the data compels them to. So those are, if you want, so the most interesting aspects um, of, of this joint inversion. Um, yeah, so again, uh, sort of what I just said in a, in a bit of a summary slide and with sort of bigger um, figures for this relationship. Um, so we have sort of a strong relationship here and uh, uh, some extra scatter. Um, and 
I mean, if you if you think about it, uh, this is quite suspicious or quite strange because we have a low or negative velocity anomaly and a positive density anomaly, so something some material that's slower um, and um, more dense than the surrounding. So that's quite counterintuitive. But to me, uh, certainly, this is one of the features that I would then investigate most as an as a next step because it uh, yeah it is counterintuitive and uh, it is sort of mandated by the data to uh, to to be in this uh, in this model. And as a final example, I want to show you this uh, sort of a similar thing with the joint inversion. So this is a slightly bigger region. So we. We're zooming out, we're going back to sort of the whole Western US here. And this is now joint inversion with the same kind of coupling, but with magnetotellurics um, and, and density. And uh, I'm showing you here resistivity on the left-hand side and, and density anomaly on, on the right-hand side um, at 30 kilometers. So the same slice, the same depth with looked at, but also now at 100 kilometers. And yeah, it's it's this, the same principle. We can see some, some very nice correspondence. For example, here, especially at 100 kilometers, you can see, for example, the high resistivity structure here, this dark blue that corresponds to high density. Um, and this is perfectly compatible in terms of physical properties that we know uh, with a descending uh, slab. So this is the Juan de Fuca slab. So we have a subduction zone here um, of the Pacific coast, uh, the Western Pacific coast in the US. Um, and the interesting thing here, for example, is that you can see this dashed line. That's the, the boundary of the Juan de Fuca slab from a global geodynamic model. So we can see how here the joint inversion has um, made a nice um, relationship between density and, and resistivity um, and also helped us to focus on certain features. And we can see other things here. So here um, in, the, in this 100 kilometers uh, slice, uh, the, the high resistivity always corresponds to positive um, density anomaly and low resistivity corresponds to negative density anomaly. So that we have established a, a very good connection between, between the different methods and we can image um, sort of structures such as the Wyoming Craton or um, here the remnant of another subduction zone known as the Silesia slab curtain. Um, and at Crustal levels, levels, the picture looks looks fairly similar. We have this uh, low density anomaly and, and low resistivity that correspond to each other. But if you look carefully, there are deviations from this assumption. And again, this for me, this is now at, or at the moment the most interesting aspect of this. So we can see there's a region here where we have low resistivity and high density and this will become even more apparent when we look at the vertical slice that goes along this black line. So here is a, a vertical profile. We can see these um, low density structures, so negative density anomaly, red, and uh, high or low resistivity in yellow. But for example, here on the, in the towards the east, we can see that we have a continuous Con, um, conductive structure, low resistivity structure, but a flip in density anomaly. And again, this is uh, violating our, the assumption of our joint inversion. So we are sort of, if you want so, refuting the hypothesis that there is a one-to-one -one relationship between density and resistivity. That's what we're aiming for. But the data tell us this is not possible we, to fit the observations, there has to be a change in um, density across the structure, but the um, resistivity has to stay the same. And the really interesting thing for me is you can see those black triangles, those are the boundary of, sort of the large 
tectonic boundaries in this region. And you can see that this, this change matches exactly with that tectonic boundary. So again, we are learning something about the Earth here from this sort of violation of um, the constraint or the, the, the thing that we put in the, um, in the joint inversion in the sense that, yeah, something different operates in these two uh, tectonic domains. And we can look at also the relationship that comes out of this, of this joint inversion. So I'm plotting here density against resistivity for this whole model. And you can see this, yeah, I call it the, the dinosaur, this dinosaur shaped um, structure. If you focus on the, the sort of the main features, so we have a tail here, yes, and the back and the head, and then the two legs. And again, it's, uh, I repeat this because it's a sort of a new concept and maybe um, not completely intuitive, but the joint inversion, if, if, it, if it could, would just put everything on this sort of one line. We would want to have a single relationship here. So the fact that we do have these legs here means that these are features that are driven by the data. So we can only explain our data by having this deviation from, from a one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and in this case, I have done a bit of analysis what this could possibly mean. Um, and so this material here, you can see it has nearly neutral buoyancy. Um, so whatever causes the, the resistivity has to have a similar density as the, as the background. And if you know a little bit about um, electrical conductivity, in the Earth, um, so the current assumption is that these um, low resistivity structures are caused by some small amounts of things like graphite or sulfides or fluids. So graphites and uh, sulfides have a similar density as the background. So this is some sort of um, graphite or flu uh, sorry graphite or sulfide induced um, low resistivity structure, whereas fluids have a um, lower density than the background. So um, increasing the fluid content decreases resistivity and um, decreases resistivity. And I've done some first order calculation and the predictions actually match um, quite well. I have a plot here, but I'm, I'm sort of gonna skip over this in the interest of time. But what we, what we can do is we can map these structures sort of back into the spatial domain. And we can see, for example, where we have these high density conductors and these low density conductors and get some, some really interesting patterns. Uh, and this, I'm, I'm not gonna go into, um, into those details, um, tells us something, for example, about the distribution of, of fluids and melts in this, in this region. So here in the Southern active uh, basin and range province, we have a lot of uh, pervasive fluids in the crust, whereas these blue regions, they are probably more related to ancient deformation zones uh, where we have graphites and, and sulfides um, that, <clears throat> sorry, cause the, these, these um, conductivity anomalies. Yeah, so again, I think the, the, the theme here or the topic here is that very often I find in, in the joint inversion, it's not the, the aspects that, that work or that conform to our expectations, but the unexpected uh, results that give us um, the most interesting results and that we can use to analyze. Uh, our data and learn something new about the Earth. Okay, now to, to finish, um, I want to show you one last um, example from on a quite different scale um, that also sort of highlights some of the sort of issues with joint inversion and again sort of how we can make things consistent. And this is now from, from exploration 
uh, imaging. So this is um, the problem of sub-basalt imaging. So if you're exploring for hydrocarbons, you want to find oil and gas, you need to look at sedimentary structures. But if those sediments are below a uh, flood basalt, for example, here of the Faroe Islands, um, in Northern Europe, uh, then this becomes very difficult because the, the, the salts have very high velocity and they scatter a lot of the um, seismic energy so you, you can't image the sediments underneath. And the interesting thing here and why I picked this study, there are two studies that have been performed with this these data and both do um, joint inversion. Um, so it's it's very interesting to compare how the sort of different groups approach the same problem differently. So one is uh, the study of Heinkertal that I was involved in with uh, as well that uses magnetotelluric so electromagnetic data, seismics, and gravity. And then there's the study of Pansnaidal uh, that was done independently, and they use magnetotelurics, seismics, and control source EM. So another electromagnetic method. They don't have the gravity data, but they have two different electromagnetic methods. And because it's an exploration context, there is borehole data. So this goes back to what I showed in the, in the tutorial in the very beginning. Um, so the, the, this is now a plot of real um, borehole data, and you can see um, the graphics from the, the two publications. So on the left-hand side, this is the plot of the borehole data in Heinkerdal. On the right-hand side, the same data in Pansner et al. One thing you can already see that Pansner et al. seem to have rejected this sort of red cluster. Now, both have a color coding for depth, unfortunately, exactly with the opposite sense the color scale, so you need to sort of switch color scales when you go back and forth. You can see that otherwise, yeah, the data are, uh, are quite similar. I think, yeah, Pansner did a bit of, of data curation, uh, um, sort of rejected a few um, points here. But the more important thing is that both studies um, assumed, okay, we know something about the relationship between seismic velocity and resistivity. So, so we should use that and use that in our joint inversion approach. So on the left-hand side, this black line, that's the parameter relationship used by Heinke et al. And on the right-hand side, that's the relationship used by Pansner et al. And uh, if, you, if you go to the paper, they discuss that they specifically sort of design the relationship and use sort of a, a combination of two different functions to capture this steep rise here of um, seismic velocity, sorry, resistivity with seismic velocity. So they made, took special effort to capture this, this, this increase here. Whereas you can see in the study of Heinke et al, um, that this is based on, on, a, on a single function that just sort of just continuously um, sort of rises, but it doesn't capture that steep rise, but there actually just goes sort of yeah, moderately um, steep towards um, higher velocities and, and higher resistivities. And yeah, you can, you can put this um, in a single plot. So the, the black, is the Heinke et al curve, the blue is the Pansner et al curve, and um, the dots here now are again the borehole data, but instead of using, so these individual points are the individual borehole measurements, and these are taken like set a few tens of centimeters or centimeters apart, and here now is uh, the um, same data, but average to a scale of about 100 meters. Because when we do the joint inversion, we use sort of cell sizes that are, are on the order of yeah, about 100 meters. So you can see two things. First of all, the, the scatter is reduced quite a lot. And you can also see that for a for large part of the range, they actually do overlap or quite, quite closely. And only at the extreme ends, those 
those two um, curves overlap. And if you look at the data points now in this average space, um, you can also see that where there is a discrepancy, that's where we on the this sort of on this average don't really have any any data anymore. So for the most part, um, these um, overlap. But I think this is a very good sort of illustration of okay, you give the same data to two different groups and they come to to different conclusions. And of course, this will have an impact on what you get out in in your joint inversion. And uh, here is now the comparison between sort of the joint and the individual inversions for a vertical slice. So uh, here is depth, this is um, profile length in kilometers and along one of the seismic lines. And the seismic model especially illustrates quite nicely um, that um, the problem of imaging below the, the basalt, so it, it catches the, the top of the basalt, that's this uh, interface between blue and, and red here, extremely well, but below this, there's virtually nothing. Um, on the other hand, the MT in this case um, doesn't have a good um, expression of that top of the basalt. You can see it has sort of a similar uh, boundary, but then sort of deviates quite strongly but has some structure below the basalt. And then when we put these two things together, and this is now an example where yeah, the two methods, if you want to talk to each other quite well, because we have this strong connection from the parameter relationship is, and we get a um, combined model that looks actually quite different than the individual models because the seismic data provides information about the top of this basalt boundary. And once that is fixed, the MT then provides information about the internal structure of the basalt and what's happening um, underneath. And we can then go back from our joint model back to the, um, to the borehole data. So here you can see the, the blue line, that's the, the really scattered borehole data that was plotted as, as these individual plots, uh, points in the previous plot. Uh, and then an averaged version, and then the yellow dots are the um, extracted from the, the model at the location of this borehole. And you can see how that um, matches quite nicely um, from with the general trend of the borehole data. But you can see there's a lot more heterogeneity in the borehole than we can capture with the joint inversion, because as you can see here now, uh, the distance between those cells is like on the order of a couple of hundred meters. <clears throat> and we can then also look at the comparisons of the models. So um, this is just for, for, for our study, for the Heinke et al study. And here I'm comparing the models um, that we get from, from, from our study. And at the bottom is the, the study of Panzneldahl. And uh, yeah, again, color scales, of course, people have sort of individual choices. So here it's plotted in terms of resistivity. Here it's uh, plotted in terms of velocity, but because the two are related, you can at least structurally compare those. You can see there's actually quite a lot of similarity between those, um, those different um, structures, but there are also a few differences. And maybe the biggest one is here, this brook done, that's where this, this borehole is. Um, and you can see, for example, that Panzner et al. have um, a sort of thicker bulge here in their, um, in their bottom structure, which is, um, you know, what, for example, what oil industry um, would be interested in, whereas here it's it's a, it's a bit bit more flat. Um, also, Panzneidal have a bit more deep structure, um, whereas our model sort of loses detail here at the bottom. Uh, that's of course also a, a, um, partially due to the different methods that have been used, but also due to the different choices um, that have been made in in the joint inversion. Um, and yeah, but I think that the, the, the main message here is, okay, um, we've shown that with um, this parameter relationship, 
is um, we can produce the sort of reasonable models. And there are two ways if you want to, to look at it. You can say, okay, as long as the parameter relationship um, is sensible, the models that come out of here are, are also sensible. And I would call this the sort of explorative mode. Or if we go back to our sort of hypothesis testing idea, you could say, okay, um, we cannot refute the hypothesis that both either of these uh, relationships um, are sensible, even though they are quite different. Both sort of models fit the data and both sort of produce sensible structures. Um, and in this case, that's probably due to the fact that actually where it matters in this uh, velocity range of 6,000 to um, meters per second to one and a half thousand meters per second, those relationships um, are actually quite similar. And where they di diverge, there, there's actually no data. And you can also see this um, in the model C, I mean, the highest velocities about that we get is on the order of 5,000 meters per second. So somewhere around here where those two relationships are quite quite similar. But I think it would also be quite uh, interesting now to, to try maybe if some other relationships and see if um, sort of which ones of those we can sort out. And again, that can help us to learn a bit more uh, about the earth and sort of how this relationship works. Yeah, so this brings me to the end. So joint and constraint inversions are a useful tools to investigate the Earth. I hope I showed you a little bit of that. Um, the How you couple, how you connect the different properties, that's really the crucial element of joint inversion. It describes what we assume about sort of what we know about the Earth, and that's what distinguishes it from, from individual inversions. And we can approach this um, joint inversion from two perspectives. We can say we're just we're exploring, right? We know, don't know very much about this, the, the structures in the earth. So if all the ingredients that we use, uh, particularly that, that coupling, the, the, the connection between the parameters are representative, then the, the resulting models are you know, valuable, useful representations of what's happening within the earth. Or we could say it's we're using a hypothesis-based approach, uh, and that means we, we're formulating a hypothesis that we want to, to refute. And yeah, so that's most powerful in cases where we then sort of the result of the joint inversion is that we, we cannot fit the data, we cannot make a, make a connection, for example, as I showed in the, with the magnetic data. And I think... Um, if you combine those two views, yes, you have a sort of quite two quite powerful tools to to um, learn more about sort of what's happening within the Earth. And I think with that, I'll I'll stop for now and and open for questions. <laughs>